uh, in the interest of time, let's move on to our next speaker of today, Anusha. So as an introduction, Anusha is head of advisory at Vogue Business, where she leads data, insights, and bespoke consumer research projects for brands and businesses. And Anusha will be telling us more about a very important topic, namely sustainability, which Max also talked about briefly as well. I don't think I need to emphasize the importance of this topic, given the urgency of climate change and planet preservation, but it's also something dear to us at DEPT, given our commitments to our impact, to impact and given our B Corp status. So let's get to Anusha's talk titled, The Green Ceiling, Breaking Down Barriers for the Sustainable Shopper. Anusha, are you there? Hi, Tobias. Yes, I'm here. Love Hi. to be joining you today. Amazing. Anusha, how are you? You good? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. I'm dopamine dressing a little bit for this event because it's such a grim, grisly day here in London. Look, we appreciate it. Anything that brings some color into this talk, I appreciate it. Bring it on. <laughs> well, look, I hope you have a great talk. I'm really looking forward to it myself and we can maybe have a chat afterwards, okay? Yeah, great, look forward to it. All right, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anusha Kutigan and I'm the head of advisory at Vogue Business. We provide um, industry insights and reporting to professionals with an interest in the fashion and luxury industry. And I personally lead all of our uh, research and strategy and bespoke custom projects for brands um, and businesses with an interest in our sector. Um, as Tobias mentioned today, I'm going to be talking to you about the green ceiling and how we can be breaking down barriers for the sustainable shopper. And I just wanted to start with why this might matter in the context of the luxury space. If we think about some of the brands that have in recent years achieved more of a cult status or a cult following, so brands like Lueve or Mesa Margiela or Alexander Wang, then there are certain attributes that we can see in our research are driving that interest. So we do something called the Vogue Business Index that we produce twice a year, and it's our authoritative ranking of the top 60 global luxury brands around the world. Um, and as part of this, we do a huge piece of consumer research. And in the latest edition, we surveyed over five and a half thousand consumers. And as part of that, we asked them to rate um, brands for a number of different attributes. And so when we look at these brands that have achieved that cult status, we can see that they index over average for certain uh, values and attributes. And some of those include things that you would expect to see from luxury brands or high-end fashion brands, like offering innovative design or having an interesting brand story. But some of the other things that we can see that are bubbling up in those um, values that make them more appreciated by consumers is making them feel more connected to those in the know about fashion and also offering products that are sustainable and ethically sourced. So if we think about what consumers are doing in the journey that they're going on when they're trying to shop more sustainably. We can see in, in our most recent piece of consumer research that 65% of global consumers try to get informed about whether or not the luxury brand that they're buying is socially responsible. Nearly 70%, so 69%, say that knowing a luxury brand cares about sustainability can make a difference in whether or not they choose that brand. And if given a choice between a luxury product or brand that is sustainable and a luxury product or brand that isn't, 71% say that for the same product, they would choose a luxury brand that supports sustainability rather than a brand that does not. So the sentiment and the motivation for consumers to shop more sustainably is there. And they're also willing to do that research. But what we need to do as an industry is make that information more accessible for consumers and more digestible for them too. Now, this is a challenge in and of itself, because if we think about the ways in which we communicate to consumers, there are different levels of trust that consumers will put into different types of media. So we were quite surprised to find that although social media is a primary gateway in which consumers discover brands and discover products, actually, they don't trust it as a platform for important information as much as they might trust legacy media like magazines or newspapers. And this is especially true of consumers in the West. So this trend of trusting legacy media for information more than what people read on social media is especially true for European markets, particularly in the UK, which is ahead of the curve, but it's true for 
Italy, Germany, Spain as well. In fact, the only markets where we can see this trend inverted is China. And just tipping that point is Japan. And that's that's something that we're going to be keeping an eye on as we um, progress with this study. But what it means for us is that if we are trying to communicate information that is key to decision making and conversion, not just discovery, uh, then we actually have to have that information positioned in the right channels. And one of the ways that brands can do that is to use their own real estate and their own websites more effectively. Now, a lot of brands already communicate the progress that they're making towards sustainability and the policies that they're implementing through corporate channels. So they may have CSR sites or press releases or industry announcements and events that they use to communicate that information. But the way that information is communicated to the consumer really can do with improvement across the industry. When we look at how brands are communicating that type of information on their product pages, only 15% of those brands that we uh, research exhaustively in the Vogue Business Index are actually putting that information on product pages on their e-commerce sites. Primarily, uh, <laughs> nearly 40% of brands don't have that information anywhere on their e-commerce sites. Uh, nearly the same uh, percentage, so 38% of brands put that information and into their footer on their website. And this kind of makes the information more hidden and harder to discover in the consumer journey. Only 8% put it in their primary navigation and 8% put it um, in the about section as part of that taxonomy. So there is work that we need to do to just make that information more readily accessible but also available at the point at which a consumer is trying to make a decision about whether or not to buy that product. And one of the things that we're trying to advocate more for is to have more of that information available at that point of purchase so that the customer has all of the information that they need to make that decision when they're ready to hit buy. Another thing that we need to consider as an industry is how we elevate services as part of the sustainability journey for consumers. That there are a number of challenges that consumers are engaging with as they try to uh, make the right decisions about which brands they want to buy, but also the right products to buy as well. And anyone who's worked in retail and fashion for a long time will know that although sustainability is becoming more important as a priority for shoppers, those elements of convenience or price or quality are still really important drivers and we don't abandon them in order to progress with sustainability. We need to do it um, in partnership with those elements as well. So elevating things like services as part of that sustainability toolkit is something that will help particularly in the luxury end of the market because consumers already expect a high level of customer service in that segment. Again, looking at the number of brands that are offering repair services um, in the Vogue Business Index, um, 37%, so over a third welcome repairs, but over 40% don't advertise a service at all. And this is something that brands not only need to consider as part of their service offering, but it actually affects their supply chain as well. So if you're a brand that's thinking of introducing more sustainability services, particularly elements like repairs, then you actually have to consider whether or not your product is made to be repairable in the first place. And this means that sustainability can't be treated as a silo that one team is responsible for within your business. It means that that team has to talk to the supply chain management team. It means that team also has to talk to the marketing team about how that's being communicated both internally and externally. And so really sustainability has to run throughout the infrastructure of a business for it to be meeting all of the various demands that customers have. And we can't always start at 100%. Brands do not become sustainable brands overnight, but there are steps that brands can take towards that. And there are a couple of different examples that I just wanted to share with you that have really excited me in recent times. Um, I think collaboration and partnership is one of the ways in which we succeed together in this industry and actually fuel innovation and progress and sustainability faster. So one example of this is Prada's Miu Miu uh, doubling down on upcycling projects in collaboration with Levi's. I think it's a really exciting partnership because you see the combination 
of a high-end fashion brand with a middle market fashion brand, both of them with their own kind of cult following, but upcycling products to bring newness and novelty into the industry in an exciting and sustainable way. Um, at Bottega Veneta, they've recently announced that they're going to be re-releasing handbags from their archives and introducing lifetime warranty for repairs across their products as well. And again, that's a, 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 a an initial step, but that's something that will come to affect more and more of their product over time. Another example is Burberry offering trench coat uh, refresher, refreshment to reproof for water resistance using biodegradable and non-toxic products. Again, making those products more durable, um, focusing on their heritage products that everyone knows first, but thinking about how those the quality of the products in the first place lend themselves to being repaired um, and being used over and over again. Um, and abandoning uh, the idea of planned obsolescence that has often permeated throughout the fashion industry. If we look at a brand that has actually elevated this into um, more, more towards 100% of product, um, then I think Longchamp is a really good example. Um, and I'm a really big fan of uh, this initiative from Longchamp, which is um, basically enabling shoppers to customize their signature uh, Le Pliage handbag, but also introducing more and more sustainability throughout their supply chain as well. So for these um, handbags, the canvas is made from 100% recycled polyester, and that's derived from plastic that's extracted from waste. You can go onto their site and there are loads of different elements that customers can personalize from the body of the product to the trimming, um, embroidery of initials, um, stamping, um, and adding tassels and embellishments as well. It's a really interactive experience. It's an experience that brings delight to the shopper, but they also have the reassurance that no matter what they do with this product, no matter which variation they purchase, they're going to have those elements of sustainability. And Longchamp has committed that by the end of the ne of next year, all of the canvas that they use will be made from recycled fibers. And they already use recycled polyamide, polyester, linen, and cotton. Now Longchamp is obviously further ahead in their journey towards uh, creating 100% sustainable products than some brands. But the implication means that they're removing the mental labor that consumers have to perform to figure out what proportion of Longchamp products are going to be sustainable and what proportion isn't because by the time they achieve that goal, shoppers will be reassured that no matter what they buy from the brand, they're going to be shopping in a more sustainable way. And that's what we mean by removing barriers for the consumer. It's about reducing the amount of work that they have to do to figure out how they're going to make the right decision about their purchases. So I just want to leave you with a few key recommendations. One is to continue working on how we communicate with shoppers through the most trusted channels. Um, what do you have in your communications portfolio um, currently? And which of those channels are actually going to land the right information at the right time for the consumer? The second one is about thinking of the role that new categories can play in this and how we can introduce newness more frequently to reach frequent shoppers. As, as retailers and as brands, we still have a responsibility to sell things um, and to delight the consumer, to build retention, to build loyalty and repeat purchases. But that doesn't need to be mutually exclusive of sustainability. We can use sustainable initiatives to achieve those goals too. The third thing is that the more information we provide to shoppers at the point of sale, the more confidence they will have in the product and the brand that they're purchasing. And as I mentioned, attaining 100% sustainability doesn't happen overnight, but we should be prepared to communicate the progress that we're making towards achieving those goals to the consumer, not just to the industry. It's fine to say that you haven't done everything yet. I think actually it would be remiss of us to say we've solved sustainability anytime soon, but consumers really welcome that transparency and they like to see the effort that brands are making and the steps that they're taking. And finally, disclosure is key. Just make it easy for consumers to discover that information as part of their shopping journey. Um, I would also say that although we focus on the environmental elements today, 
uh, don't neglect other values like diversity and inclusion and social impact. Those elements are just as important to consumers um, that are continuously being built into that framework of ESG. And actually, we can see that in the way that consumers are behaving, they kind of expect progress against environmental goals as table stakes and actually social impact and the ways that brands help people are starting to be elevated in that prioritization. And then treat sustainability services as an extension of customer service because it can help to drive that loyalty and retention. Uh, that brings me to the end of my talk today for Debt Promise Day. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that might have come into bias. Amazing. Anusha, thank you so, so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I actually do have a couple of questions for you. The yeah, first one, shoot. a question from our audience. Um, uh, I like this one. This one is quite nice. When asked, many would say, of course, I care about sustainability, and I think many do. But fashion is also quite emotional. What if you just love that amazing design of a not so sustainable brand? Is the question, I suppose. How, how, how should one temper those emotions when trying to make a person's decision, I suppose? Yes. You know, I, th I think that's such a, an interesting question because um, it assumes that you, if you love something that you don't believe is necessarily sustainable, mm -hmm. um, that you can't have it. Mm -hmm. um, what I like to talk about is delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. So um, we talk about instant gratification and how consumers expect that um, in the highly digital world that we live in. Mm -hmm. um, I primarily purchase my uh, fashion um, items through resale and, and secondhand shops and uh, charity shops. Mm -hmm. uh, now, granted, if everyone shopped the way that I did, then I would probably not have a job. Um, <laughs> but there are more and more resale options becoming available to the consumer. And right. you know, very often I'll see something in a shop and I'll be tempted to buy it, right. but I will resist that temptation. And I cannot tell you the number of times I've seen that garment that I admired or loved um, hanging in a shop window come up on eBay or come up on Depot a couple of years out of it after it's gone out of season. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you're a particularly trend-led individual, then maybe that won't work for you. But mm -hmm. for me, I, I don't personally mind too much about keeping up with the trends. I'm happy to de delay that gratification yep. and see that product have a longer lifespan and be loved by more than one person. And I, I actually get more of a sense of satisfaction from buying it through a resale um, avenue. Um, and I think the same that can be said for things that are currently in season, actually. We've done a lot of research at Vogue Business on the resale market. And actually, it's surprising uh, the number of products that people can find through resale um, channels, but also the role that resale plays in helping people to access things that have gone out of um, gone out of stock in stores. And you, and you can actually still find um, quite a lot of inventory through those resale channels. You know, sometimes somebody has been given a gift that they don't want or it's been on the wrong side. And you just need to do a little bit more research. And I think there's an opportunity for brands to partner more with those technology platforms that power resale in order to make that a more viable channel for consumers too. Yeah, lovely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I had actually a, a question for myself. I mean, in your talk, you mentioned you have your sort of primary navigation and you mentioned only 8% of brands sort of emphasize their sustainability efforts in the primary navigation piece of their uh, digital presences. I was yes. curious. Um, I, I, so my, 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 my question is, um, you mentioned sort of also at the end of your talk, it doesn't matter, what, like transparency is important. So showcasing perhaps you're not fully the way there, but I get the sense perhaps that brands don't want to emphasize their sustainab sustainability efforts if they're not quite where they want to be yet. And I guess, you know, um, sh is it the case that, how, how do you feel we should help help those brands to prioritize it over time, I suppose. You know, I, I actually get this a lot. I get asked this a lot, Tobias, mm. um, especially when I, I go and talk to some of the brands that we evaluate in the index mm. and they haven't been scored as highly as they'd like to um, when it comes to sustainability or ESG. And they say, but we're doing these things. We just don't talk about them. Right. And my response would be that it plays a really big role in how a consumer perceives you mm -hmm. um, and actually there are a number of brands out there that do communicate that progress that are transparent when they haven't um, achieved 100% of what they want to achieve but as I said consumers welcome that 
honesty um, and that authenticity. Mm -hmm. So if I think about brands like Reformation or Pangaea, they're really good examples of brands that communicate in that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, Reformation um, had a, a really cool campaign. I think it was on a, its swimwear line mm -hmm. um, not too long ago where they said this is not a sustainable product. And they spoke about the process that they went into trying to develop a textile that was appropriate to the garment and waterproof, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it didn't have all of the qualities of sustainability that they wanted because the textile mm -hmm. didn't exist yet. And so actually it became a really good storytelling exercise between Reformation and their customers to say, this is the journey that we are going on as, as an organization to try and be more sustainable. We're not there yet, but this is the product that we've, we've created and hopefully we will continue to improve. Um, and I think in the in the culture that we live in now, um, people do welcome that honesty. Um, and there's room for being a little bit vulnerable and, and taking a, a, some more risks in that space. Yeah, fair enough. We can't you, you can't just flip the script 180 degrees from today to tomorrow, right? And I think yeah, that's exactly. completely appreciated. Anusha, thank you again for your sh for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. I hope you have a brilliant day, and uh, hope to speak to you soon. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Tobias. Good luck with the rest of the sessions. It's a really exciting agenda. And can I just say, I really love the design of the platform, the retro digital platform that you guys have created for the event today. It's really cool. We love it too. Thank you, Anusha. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a great right. day. Take care. Bye. Take care.